Right. Good afternoon, Facebook world. My name is Sarah Rizik Bear. I'm the program director of Tandem Partners in Early Learning. I'm very excited here to talk to Inosanto Nagara. He is a local children's book author. Um, he is originally from Jakarta, Indonesia, but has resided here in Oakland for several, several years here with his family. Very active member in the Oakland community. Um, and so we're really excited to talk to him today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Ino Santo has authored f and illustrated four very popular children's books, as you can see here. A is for Activist, Counting on Community, My Night in the Planetarium, and The Wedding Portrait. Um, so, Ino Santo, I know that you started your career as a graphic designer and you continue to do so, um, but what has brought you to the world of writing children's books? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still a graphic designer. I work for Design Action Collective. We're a worker co-op union design studio that um, was a spin-off from Inkworks Press, which was a worker-owned union print shop um, in, in the Bay Area for 30-some years. And um, I was originally doing graphic design there, and we found ourselves needing to do more and more graphic design, becoming more and more important tool for social justice movement. Um, and so we decided to create a whole entity that is entirely focused on that, and now we're doing web and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I did not see m myself as becoming a children's book author. <laughs> it wasn't part of my career plan. Um, I originally studied zoology, and then I started wow. doing graphic design, and then now um, what happened was I live in this community um, with five other families, and my son, is the youngest of eight born into this community and so I'd been reading children's books to children for many years. The oldest kid um, is now in college mm -hmm. <laughs> and my son is now in eighth grade but um, I mean is eight years old he's in third grade but when he was first born I started realizing that I was going to be reading um, a lot of those same books over and over again some that I really enjoyed reading over and over and over again and <laughs> some not so much <laughs> um, and so um, I started looking around to see where is the book that I really wanted to read to my kid and not finding it, uh, decided to write my own. And originally it was just going to be uh, something I was just going to do with, you know, maybe do a hundred, maybe even do, do a dozen, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, give them out to friends as a gift or something like that. Um, I sat down with my team at Design Action. We happened to be on a retreat and as an exercise we kind of went through the ABCs um, to try to say, it's like, what words would you associate with each of these letters that um, has something to do with social justice activism? Um, and uh, starting with that list, uh, on one May Day I sat down, we have May Day off as a holiday, mm -hmm. and I just started writing what I would write to go, you know, to go with each of those letters. Um, and then I found out that you can't really just print 25 of board books um, if, you know, and it didn't need to be a real board book and you know and since I'm a graphic designer and illustrator I could do all that part I come out of printing so I know the printing process mm -hmm. these sort of short run print things were are a, a real problem so found out that the place that I could do this that would um, make sense had a minimum run of 2000 and so I was like oh do I print 2,000 of them and you know knowing that I'd go into debt to do that so I did a Kickstarter got enough excitement around that um, took out a bunch of loans from family and friends to these sort of short-term small loans with the idea that uh, if they you know I couldn't pay them back in five years I would um, I would somehow refinance on a credit card or something wow. <laughs> um, and decided to go for 3,000 just for economy of scale and um, and it turns out there's more of us out there than I realized. And so that was how it all started, and it was very... And, and the book that you're talking about um, is A is for Activist. Yeah, correct, your and first it was book. actually, you know, and it was the board oh. book version of it mm -hmm. that, that I did originally. Um, so, but that, yeah, so that's the story. So this is actually um, probably one of the most popular social justice themed books. I see it in bookstores everywhere. And when people think about social justice books, I mean, this is the first thing that comes up. So I'm really curious to see, you know, how did it gain momentum and popularity? And you said you started with just 3,000 copies, but then obviously it's grown a ton more uh, than that. So how do people start to get to know it? Um, I mean, when I first 
did it, I was basically, I had, had two pallets worth of books in the living mm -hmm. room and a website, and um, I was selling them, you know, as people ordered them. Somehow the word got out through different networks, and they did sell pretty quickly. And so I had a choice at that point. Do I keep on doing this where I'm running the post office every morning, doing, you know, onto my website every night, <laughs> trying to uh, do all the mailing labels, all this kind of stuff, and, you know, and constantly dealing, you know, and, the, and it w was not very efficient for bookstores. Um, economy of scale wise, my printing costs were very high compared mm -hmm. to what real publishers can do. Um, so I, th you know, but all the bookstores were saying that did carry it were saying, oh, you know, we love it. It's selling better than Harry Potter, and you know, you should definitely, you know, someone will publish it. Um, so I started writing to various publishers, and then I discovered apparently, self-publishing is considered kind of the kiss of death for <laughs> books, and most publishers will not r publish something that's already been self-published. Um, oh. So. Um, and so what I found, there were very few publishers actually wrote back, even though it sort of, I thought it had kind of proof of, proof of concept uh -huh. and that there was, you know, clearly something of a market for it, but, you know, within the world that I knew. Um, but Seven Stories is different. They, um, they decided to take on, on the book. We did a round of um, editing on it with our Corey Silverberg, who's the author of What Makes a Baby, and okay. Sex is a Funny Word, um, <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. and uh, they took it from there, and basically, you know, b with their knowing how to get it into bookstores, getting the economy of scale th around the printing costs, okay. and, um, and more of a national reach, they're the ones who were able to get it into bookstores. But I think also, you know, World events <laughs> continue to make a difference, you know, as as um, things happen in the world. More people have become interested in talking about s social justice and activism with their children, and so um, it's also the right time for it. Um, it was one of these books when I first wrote it. I I wasn't expecting it to go very far. There were things that I thought, well, some parents are gonna be concerned with this or that and you know should I you know but I was like I'm gonna be on the right side of history I want to write this for my kid what I want to say I'm not really you know, this isn't a marketing <laughs> exercise you know it doesn't really you know as long as I feel right about it that's what matters and um, as it turns out there's actually a lot more of us out there than than I give credit for I think. yeah and um, I, so actually it's a, it's a really great segue because all of your books have this um, activism theme right so a is for activists, you know, it's a, just like you said, it's an alphabet book that talks about various activist things. So for example, Z is for Zapatista, mm -hmm. I think you had F is for feminism, and you talk about those things. Counting on community, which I definitely want to talk more about, seems to be inspired by this community you live in here. And talks about, you know, um, living in community with one another, not in competition with one another. My Night in the Planetarium covers the you know, your experience as a child in Indonesia and the revolution there, and then the wedding portrait about breaking rules. Um, and you're saying, you know, this is, some people have criticized you for this. Some people have criticized you for saying um, that it's propaganda for kids, that it's brainwashing, why are we get, introducing children to these ideas? You said that really wasn't necessarily your intention. So, um, you know, I know you wanted to write this book for your child, but what was your intention in producing books like this as your career has grown, mm -hmm. um, and why do you think it's important <laughs> that we have them? Yeah, I mean, like I said, my original intention of writing A is for Activists was to have the book that I wanted to read to my kid. Um, you know, there were all kinds of books out there for every career path that their, you know, various parents are doing. You know, my family is a family of social justice activists, organizers, teachers, and so the, my initial goal was to have a book that represented the values that we share, um, and you know, I I don't actually. I'm actually pretty much a, pretty against <laughs> propagandizing as kids, what, you know. But that doesn't mean that we don't share our values with our kids, mm -hmm. you know. And like A is for Activist is really I wrote it for two-year-olds. The the um, rhythm, alliteration, the big words, the, you know, uh, the two-year-olds love that and the parents are able to be excited about or okay. caregivers are able to be excited about how reading to the kids um, you know the, the more bored you are as a parent as a you know caregiver reading to your kid the 
<laughs> less likely your kid's going to actually be interested in, in reading. And so um, my hope was to give us ourselves something that we can be excited about. And so there's a kid layer, an adult layer, there's a cat in a, on every page. You know, there's, there's sort of a bunch of different ways in which it approaches um, uh, being able to share values. You know, and then later on it becomes something that as they go older they might have conversations about it, but nothing about it says that you have to, <laughs> I'm not expecting, you know, to, it's not a, a laundry list of things that you have to memorize. Um, so that's sort of, you know, how I approach that one. So as for activists mm -hmm. it was about the issues, counting on community for me is about how we live, you know, so it's sharing um, the difference between sort of the, the, the sort of outward facing activism and the, um, the choices we make to build community. Um, My Night in the Planetarium sort of evolves into where we talk, uh, a chance to talk about how art and social change, colonialism, and, um, and ultimately, you know, how when bad things happen, there's something we can do about it. Um, mm -hmm. And then Wedding Portrait is, is, is the next, you know, step in this, which has to do with, um, um, how you 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 know it's about direct action and civil disobedience so it's about the you know, you know um, tactics and strategies around around social change and how change happens has always happened through people resisting and and breaking the rules and so the way I s see it is it's kind of a you know step by step around around um, you know how to see yourself as a person in the world with agency. So that's sort of my common thread around it, is okay. that at, for kids, like with the planetarium came out, you know, when Trump was elected, it wasn't written about him or anything like that, but it was, uh, ha, you know, it fits the theme of, we were, you know, in our school, everybody Eddie was saying to the kids, don't worry about it. You know, Trump won't get elected. Kids were talking about him a lot, but you know, and it's a, a, a dual immersion Spanish language school, there's a lot of immigrant families, there's a lot of families who would be vulnerable if he was elected. People were saying, don't worry, he's not going to be elected, and then he was elected. And right. then everybody was like, well, what do you tell the children? You know, we just told them that this would be bad, and it is going to be bad, and you can't say it's not going to be bad, and that it's not the case, you know, that some families will get deported, and in other issues that, you know, uh, police violence, all these things are, are real things that you can't not talk to your kids about, right. depending on who you are. And these are, you know, I, I have to say, some, so you're talking about a lot of, like, very heavy topics. You're mm -hmm. talking about Trump and some of the fears that children had around that. I know specifically in their Oakland community, um, that was a big fear for a lot of our kids because we have a lot of immigrant families in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of fear around that. Um, you know, you're talking about um, you know, values of protesting, you talk about picket lines. Um, these are just heavy topics that a lot of parents would say, is my five-year-old ready to have those conversations? Or, um, you know, how do we... So I think my, my question to you is, how do you recommend, I mean, talking about these topics that are in your books in a way that little children can understand them, but also in a way that um, let them kind of interact with the ideas rather than it be what some people have criticized as saying a brainwashing right. effect. You know, and the books are, are targeted at different age ranges, obviously, mm -hmm. so you talk about it differently with different age kids. Um, but it's exactly that, you know, it's the idea that uh, bad things happen. It, you can, you might be privileged enough to be able to shelter your kids from the bad things that happen in the world, but um, that's not who I'm writing for, and I actually suggest that they don't do that because you know there's plenty of studies that show, <laughs> you know, oh, if you try to do sort of colorblind, you know, child rearing, that actually doesn't um, undo racism. Kids will pick up what they get out of, of you know, from the the rest of society around them. So you do actually have to start these conversations with children early on, um, and in the case of bad things happening. Um, most, plenty of families have no choice but to talk to their kids about what's going to happen if this or if that, how to talk, you know, how to behave in certain circumstances. This is something that, you know, people of color have always known, you know, immigrant families have always known, you know, and so what I'm trying to do is have stories that allow us to talk about not just that bad things happen or not just to sweep under the rug that bad things happen, but to talk about what do you do about it, you know? And so the, one of the most empowering things I thought 
when after Trump was elected at our school, we had a, you know, a, a kind of like a peace march kind of thing, and everybody is welcome kind of march. You know, and all the kids marched around the school. They made a big peace sign kind of thing. You know, did that overthrow Trump? No, but you know, but I think for the kids, it was actually really important to, for them to know that there's something we're doing. We're a community. We're gonna, you know, mm -hmm. we're not. We're not saying that we can get rid of every ill in the world, but we, you know, but uh, we are here to protect you, and we are here to be, you know, and you you can have agency. There's things that you can do to to have an influence over your own future and your own life. Well, I think it's great that you have these books that are sparking those kinds of conversations yeah. for children. Um, I'm actually curious, as a father who's actually had experience talking with your son. You know about some of these topics. I'm assuming you've read some of the books with your son. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, how have those conversations gone? And I, I guess what I'd like to know is how do you feel like that's impacted him and his understanding of the world? You know, you'd probably have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, he's an eight-year-old, and he has, you know, yeah. and, and he's got a contrarian streak in him, and <laughs> it would be interesting to see what he would say I about would that. But you know, he. He's also uh, grown up with all this. Uh, you know, my my process around these books is is I, you know, these are the stories that I tell him, mm -hmm. and it's also then the stories. You know, I, I I do a lot of what I called field testing around these books, okay. and so when I I'll write a first draft, and usually he's the first kid to actually get to. So you got a market uh, research right, right <laughs> so there. That, That's wonderful. You know, wonderful. but as as a <laughs> as a wise person once told me, you know, you, you can read the the telephone book to your child, and they'll say it's good. Not all kids, but you know, there, there's a different relationship there. So then it becomes more important that other kid that I get feedback from other kids, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, sort of at each level of draft around my books, I'll send it out to various families that I know who are you know like-minded families, um, mm -hmm. and then trying to get into broader and broader circles. And I'll you know and I'll send them with a survey, a you know a feedback form with questions for the kids, and you know I try to tell, ask the parents to. Tell me what the kids actually say, not what you think about the book. But happy to hear what you think about the books, but I really uh, am, you know, it's very important to me that the books work for the kids, that they're actually interesting for the kids, that they're engaging as storytelling first, you know, and the the values and issues stuff is in there. It's a, you know, and, and they'll, they'll pick up on that. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so, you know, the way that kids are, I think, you know, and with, to your question, am I? My own kid, I think, you know, he he has a vocabulary around it. He has, you know, an understanding of it. Planetarium is set in Indonesia, and so when we, you know, we're able to go to Indonesia and actually go visit the planetarium with them, you know, it, you know he can make a connection between what's, you know, in these stories that I tell and how real they are. Um, you know, we do go to demonstrations and that kind of thing, and I think that's an empowering thing for the kids. Um, but uh, you know, one thing is he's, you know, the personal connection does make a difference. And so these books live in the world. Um, when, you know, they always say, once you've written a book, it's not yours anymore. Mm -hmm. So really the question is, how does it, you know, how do other families and how do other, <coughs> you know, teachers, educators use the book? And um, so that's what I try to listen to. And the feedback has been positive. I mean, and as for activists, they actually made into a, the, uh, picture book format, which you know, when I wrote it, it was for two-year-olds. I didn't wasn't thinking about how, how you would actually read it um, mm -hmm. for kids who are are older. But teachers asked for it, and um, the publisher finally said, "Yeah, we should do that." And it's uh, that you know, so you people are using it in classrooms. So. Oh wow! So you have teachers yeah. um, older than infant and toddler teachers or right. school teachers asking right. for this book. Yeah. Wow. And have they ever talked to you about um, why or kinds of conversations that they've been able to have with their classrooms? By having books like this in there, yeah. I mean, that, you know, I'm the first to say I'm not an educator mm -hmm. in that sense. You know, I'm not a teacher, or, and and I live with teachers. It's a you know, I'm awed by them. They do something that I would never I pretend to do, and so I'm you know my, I but I'm confident in what I do do, which is the children's book writing and <laughs> illustrating, and um, and you know, but what they are able to do with these things as tools, I think, is amazing. Um, yeah. So. 
you know, it, a lot of that I think has to do with how much scaffolding and how much they've created that classroom where you can have these conversations, you know, in a way that makes sense. You know, you can't just parachute these things in because we are in a culture where kids are isolated from these things and they actually are getting all this information. They're getting, um, we had a really interesting exercise. Um, I did this thing with We the People, which is a great organization in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they, they have this thing where they show uh, slides um, of protests and stuff, and one of them was the uh, Colin Kaepernick, you know, mm -hmm. kneeling question, you know, and they asked again, it was like, you know, does everybody know who this is, you know, and all these kids in this mm -hmm. Boston school, like, they know who he is, you know, football player and all this stuff, and then they asked him, you know, would you know what he's doing? And it's like, oh, he's protesting. And it's like, then they ask him, so what? And the answers are all over the place, you know, right. and it's like, what's oh, the, because of, of head trauma, or <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and and, and um, so nobody's talking to these kids about what's really happening, even though they are watching football, even though uh, they're overhearing the conversations, and that they know about the action. And to me, that's more damaging, right? The idea that uh, you know you've got this whole generation who is being is not is getting sort of they're having to make up what yeah. the stories are, and that's you know, which is kids are clever and they do come up with great stories, but. This is real stuff, so it's important for them to know what's actually happening. Well, I think you're touching. Oh, I think you're touching on a few things. I, I think you know, there's Paulo Freire talks a lot about um, the importance of children and people reading the world before they can read the word. Mm -hmm. And once they learn how to read the world, then they read the word so much better because now they sure. have a focus. And then having adults to guide children, I think, is really, really important. So I'm, I'm hearing you touch on that a lot. You know, so. Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that you're able to, you know, to take your child and say, okay, here, I wrote about this planetarium and here it actually is and so now they can see it in person. Or you're talking about, wow, kids are sensing all of these things happening in our political climate. They don't totally understand what it is. And what I love is that you have these books that allow parents to say, okay, this is what's happening. I can relate it to what's happening in this book and now kids can form these really um, interesting connections to, to draw their own conclusions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, and my goal is not to give them information. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's to have, through storytelling, give them um, some of the language and some sort of understanding of how, of the relationship between, you know, action and effect and, <laughs> you know, and some background stuff around colonialism and what these, you know, because these are things that, uh, you know, that, have long tails, right? They're, they're how, why we're dealing with this stuff right now. And if you just try to isolate something mm -hmm. right now, it's like, why did this happen? You're, you know, uh, it's hard enough for adults to understand, you know, these isolated things. And, you know, and kids are getting just very sort of yeah. mixed information about it. So, yeah, I taught um, ethnic studies for a year in high school a few years ago. Um, and that was actually a big thing. There was a lot of concepts and principles that a lot of my students just had not yet been exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever their opinion was, wasn't important. It was more about, can they be exposed to a concept and then be able to talk about it? Sure. So if my student, I always feel like if they had had, you know, books like this that really brought up, um, you know, difficult situations, but at a level that they can understand. So as they grow older, they develop those ideas, but they're starting from someplace. And I, and I think that's actually the beauty of your book. It's, it's not that you're right. You're not giving information. You're really sparking conversations. And however a parent wants to take that. So I even feel like even your critics that are saying, you know, that they don't like the content, well, you know what? Great. They can have a conversation about what's happening. And I, and sure. I think yeah. that ultimately that is really important. And that's the thing. I mean, you were asking earlier about the, the criticism stuff. You know, the people who are completely on the other side, who, you know, I get a lot of that just sort of trolling that happens and whatever. Like, that doesn't bother, you know, so I, you know they're they're propagandizing their kids with <laughs> other stuff as we know <laughs> you know yeah. but the um which isn't that it's not a problem for our society but it's you know that like where they're coming from is is completely missing the point but i think the thing that um is a little more difficult for me is for people who are on our side mm -hmm. who you know are really uncertain about you know whether or not this question of appropriateness and what you know and most of the time when I get sort of a review like that it's 
you know, it's it's always people who have not actually read it with their kids. You know, uh -huh. so it's there's this sort of adult gatekeeper world that is reviewing children's books based on this model of what children's books are supposed to be in their minds. Um, you know, and I'm not going to force somebody to read a book to their kid if they don't feel comfortable with it, obviously. But um, but all the people who love it are say my kid loves it. You know, and that's the right. part that that is most important to me. So that actually, uh, that's great, um, because that brings me to my next question, which is, um, you're obviously very propo uh, a big proponent of having books like this in the world. Um, and you were involved in hosting Oakland's very first social justice children's book fair, which was a wonderful event. There were many authors, just like Ino Santo here, I mean, at the events, um, showing their books. Um, Tandem had a table at the event. I loved it. We had the alphabet rockers. I mean, kids were, it was great. Um, I was so excited to see something like that happening in our community. I just wanted to, you know, so with that being said, talking about the appropriateness of these books, um, and some people even on, on the left giving critiques about that, um, why do you think it's important that these books are written and then having events like that? Um, well, you were at the event, you yeah. know, a lot of people seem to think it's important because, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it was, uh, you know, wall-to-wall -wall people throughout the whole thing. So people, well, I think right now are looking for resources and tools and, you know, ways through story. And, you know, we also had alphabet records, so it was, you know, through music and this stuff to be able to, to talk with their kids about you know the issues and what you can do about it given all the bad things that happen in the world and that we're seeing every day and the terrible example that's being given from the highest levels um, you know and so you know that particular event came about be out initially um, there's a couple different groupings of people we're really lucky in the Bay Area there's all these authors and illustrators who are doing this kind of book right now you know so mm -hmm. this um, books that are about um, representation, books that are about how social justice, um, you know, there's um, Robert Trujillo is um, the author of Furkan's um, First Flat Top and mm -hmm. illustrator of a number of other books. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he sort of initially convened a group in the Bay Area of people of color, authors and illustrators who were independently published. and. They, um, you know, and so th there was a meeting that happens regularly around that that I'm a part of, and and um, there's also other people like Laura Atkins and Kate Schatz who did the um, Red American series, Red right. American Girl series. Um, and Kate Schatz did the Fred Korematsu mm -hmm. series. You know, so there's people who are doing books like that all over the Bay Area right now, which did not exist before and I'm trying not to list everybody's names because I'm gonna miss somebody <laughs> for okay. sure but um, but the, you know but at that group I think was a big like, part of the fact that we uh, that everybody is here mm -hmm. coming together in one place was the original impetus of it but it's, I think we're gonna have to do it again because a lot of people liked it yes please do and yeah. that's actually another question I wanted to ask so um, diversity in children's books is a huge topic and I know we've spoken about it before um, I know that for Tandem, it is one of our missions is to be able to provide books for all of the children in our community that both represent who they are as well as providing windows into the lives of others. Um, so mirrors and windows. Right. And um, I'm curious, you know, that we've talked about this for a number of years. Now you have this movement of authors of color trying to put their books out to the community. Have you um, seen any change or improvement in um, the desire for more diverse books and the ability to actually get them published? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I'm around this a lot. There's other people who are better, who keep more track of mm -hmm. you know, the actual details of sort of where the publishing industry is at at this point around this stuff. Um, clearly the interest has been there that we need diverse books movement and all this kind of stuff with you know a couple over the last few years has, has really grown um, the you know there's a lot of now taking it to the next step you know that it's not just about putting black and brown faces on the same stories and characters you know it, it becomes a question of who is actually a writing the book so that our voices you know movement sort of layered on top of that and mm -hmm. um, I think um, there's a lot of movement around that. Um, a lot of the independent 
people around here are doing stuff um, outside of the traditional publishing industry because while the publishing industry wants to embrace that market of we need diverse books, um, the face of the publishing industry hasn't changed all that much. Um, mm -hmm. Again, there's probably been some change, but I'm not keeping track of the <laughs> statistics on how many, you know, but it's a very yeah. particular demographic that's making selections, the gatekeepers of, right. of, of what books get published and how they get distributed on a um, you know, national and international level, I think Inc. is, um, is maybe changing on the surface, but I think there's a lot of work to be done on the yeah. core. Yeah, and I think um, the other part of that is, you know, to the Facebook world, please buy diverse books. <laughs> we need to create a market so that publishers really see the importance of it as well. That's a huge piece of it. And by, you know, authors that are and by authors represent of different communities, because I think Absolutely. that's a big part of it also. I completely agree. Um, so I just wanted to actually go back a little bit um, and talk about um, just kind of some of your inspirations for some of these uh, particular books. So. For example, I, I, I'm curious to know, um, you talked, I want to talk a little bit about Counting on Community. So just so you know, this set of books is something I pretty much order for every one of my friends that has a new baby. I send this immediately to them <laughs> so that they have the set of books and they start off, you know, their childhood <laughs> right. Um, but I, I was, um, I particularly love Counting on Community. Um, it's, it's, as you can see, very easy to read. It's really specifically for infants and toddlers. They can chew on it, they can bite it, they can throw it. It's important. And, and it's very important <laughs> um, and play with the pictures. But um, you live here in this space where we're actually privileged to be um, as a community that you live in with five other families. So I'm curious to know how your lived experience really influenced the writing of this particular book. Um, I think it was mostly, you know, like A is for Activists, when the, when the phrase came out, that was the book, right? And I, mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, you know, oh, that's what's missing. Was A is for activists, B is for, you know. But um, but after I did that, I I really didn't want to get into the mind frame of oh now I need to do, you know, a numbers book and a shapes book and a colors book. You know, this the the purpose of these books. It's you know is not to just sort of have the range of of you know shapes, colors, mm -hmm. and numbers kind of thing being represented. Um, you know, and but. So again, counting on community came about when the idea of counting on community, you know, the double meaning of it mm -hmm. um, was kind of the source of it, right? The idea that uh, um, that this is, you know, it does say counting on community, but it's not, you know, it's like it's not just about learning how to count right? Right. <laughs> any more than you know ABC books are about learning how to read, you know, like right. the the you know these are. Are about you know these are books that are fun to read with the kids, but it's just a, a framework um, for for organizing the 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 you know vignettes within mm -hmm. in each book. So you know, counting on community for me was ab about sort of looking at the different ways in which um, you know kids might be able to relate to the concept of community and. Um, the interdependence that we have with each other. Yeah. And some of the kids in this book, as you said, were, were actually feature some of the kids that live in this house oh, and yeah. your son as well. <laughs> I think all the kids, yeah. the kids so who live here have been immortalized at, at all. one point. <laughs> yeah, I think that's Ela and some, and some other kids who, who are neighbors and friends, you know, I think. Uh, yeah, Sacha is one of those. This is oh. Aiko, who's now in college. Oh, this wow. is actually Arif from when he was a little younger and looks very different You're, now. So this is your son. Yeah. <laughs> very um, cool. I always say write what you know, but in your case you get to illustrate and write what yeah, you know. Absolutely. So <laughs> how wonderful for those kids so that they get to see that now for the rest of their lives. Um, great. Um, and you know, I, I would love to talk some more about this, but we're running a little bit out of time. So um, just to um, wrap up, I wanted to know, um, do you have any other books on the way that we can look forward to or any other upcoming projects that we can... Yeah, Let's I'm see. actually working on on um, a book right now that's now now that my kid's in um, third grade and is reading chapter books. Mm -hmm. um, this one's going to be a chapter book, and oh. it's uh, but it's going to be fully illustrated all the way. So it's a going to be kind of like if you imagine some of those folktale type books where you know large format. Uh, it has you know it'll be maybe 
hundred some pages, but also with full page images and, and spreads, um, that kind of s format for for reluctant readers and because <laughs> who who you know who's, who. Do you really have a title yet? Yeah. So the title is uh, you know where I talk about mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. um, how we live, you know, art and resistance, um, uh, breaking the rules. This one is called M is for movement, and it's about how to bring all this stuff together to. Um, build a movement. So it well, has a subtitle actually. Yeah, if you have a sample, we'd, we'd love to hear a little bit. Um, sure. This is a sneak peek, one of a kind preview to <laughs> Inosanta's new glasses. book. <laughs> so, M is for movement, also known as Humans Can't Eat Golf Balls. <laughs> so, I'll probably read it here, just the first intro. Great. Stormborn. I was born in the eye of a monsoon storm. The storms had been pounding the island for days. My parents lived in a small house in a kampung on the island of Java. Kampung just means village, but it wasn't a village anymore. It used to be a village a long time ago, back when you had to walk through the forest and rice paddies to get from one kampung to the next. Each kampung was part of a kingdom, and there were many kingdoms on the islands. The kings were always wanting more power, and sometimes they would go to war. Villages were caught in the middle, it didn't matter to them which king was their king. All kings demanded, to, demanded too much of their rice harvest. All kings made their young boys fight and kill and die in their wars. The villagers had to pretend that they were grateful to have their king instead of the evil king who ruled the kingdom next door. But really, everyone except for the king and his family hated the king. But let's get back to my kampung on the island. The island may not be what you think of when you think of an island. For one thing, it's huge. It takes three days to drive from one end to the other. Over the years, the kampungs grew into cities, the cities into big cities, and big cities into one huge metropolis. There's little space left for rice paddies, just houses and streets. At the time I was born, about 10 million people lived in my city. My kampung was called Menteng, my city, Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. There are 17,000 islands in Indonesia, so many that you can't see them all on a map. There are even islands with real-life dragons, where real-life dragons still live. Look up Komodo dragons, if you don't believe me. On Java, it wasn't unusual to have storms that time of year. It was monsoon season. But this was not your usual storm. It had come just in time to interrupt another kind of storm. Not a rainstorm, but a political storm. A time when people were clashing over who should rule the country. A time of turmoil. But I was just being born, so I didn't care about any of that. And while my parents usually cared a lot about what was going on in the country, that night they only cared about my being born. The storm raged for days, and many parts of the city were flooded. We were lucky that Menteng was on a bit of a hill, so our house was wet, but not underwater. Still, nobody could go anywhere. The water was rushing through the streets around the house like a raging river. Our electricity had been out for days, so my parents lit a kerosene lamp for light. The wind was howling and whistling through the windows. The lamp was flickering like it was going to go out any time. Flashes of lightning lit up the sky, following almost, followed almost immediately by deep, rumbling thunder. Nobody was going out in that storm, not even to have a baby. Then, almost suddenly, the whistling of the wind stopped and the pounding of the rain on the roof died down. You could hear the storm rumbling off in the distance, and there was a light pitter-patter of small raindrops hitting the windows, but otherwise, all was still. All was quiet. It was the eye of the storm. It was then that I let out my first howl, and the whole kampung knew that I was born. Thank you so much. Um, I feel so, so lucky that I got that little preview, <laughs> and I, I hope you all did too. Um, so before we wrap up, where can people purchase your books if they'd like to? Um, at your local independent bookstore. Mm -hmm. And um, most of them, if you call them or email them, they will, if they don't happen to have it in stock, they, they'll happily order it for you and you can pick it up from there and some will even order, um, mail them to you. And do you have a website people can go to in case they want to learn a little bit more about your books or purchase it online? Yeah, I mean, um, my, uh, there's a... I think www.aisforactivist.com has, has sort of has links to all my books. Great. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending yeah, time thank with you us for today. Me. It was it's really fun. <laughs> um, we love having your books and tandem story cycles collection. So, thank you. Thank you. All right.